So I want to I wanna thank you all for coming out. I want to thank Jason for uh, allowing me to, to do this. Uh, he's a buddy of mine, and, and he asked, and I said, I would love to do this. And he even, uh, I, 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 who, who has read the book? Who's read the book? Put your hands. Okay, all right. Take it easy, one at a time. <laughs> it's a great book. I read the book. It really is an, I mean, I'm, you know, you know it's, uh, it's, it's, the story's amazing. Uh, it's, it, there's, there's comedy in there, there's poignant, and I even, quote, I even wrote a quote on the back, so I even said it back there, uh, so I was honored to be asked to be one of these people, so thank you for allowing me. Look, you were uh, such a pillar of our community and entertainment and, um, and culture, it was just the natural thing to do, so I appreciate you, you doing that and uh, being here with me uh, on your home turf tonight. Thank you, Jay. Um, so, are you saying I inspired you to write the book? Yeah. I think that's what he said. Yeah. <laughs> what you, you did, you did. Um, <laughs> Day 300, you were like, exactly. what would Maz Jobrani do? <laughs> write book. <laughs> write a book. Yeah. My dad inspired me to go in the rug business. The rug and, business. Uh, uh, that didn't work out so well, so I decided to write a book about it instead. Do you think they did this because we're Iranian? This is for us, yeah. <laughs> It's very nice, very nice. Very interesting. Last one, one of a kind, friend price, just for you. He had a rug business. I'm told that 20 minutes in, they're going to bring tea. Someone's going to bring tea? Yes. Exactly. And back All the cabin. doors are locked. You can't get out. Are we take credit cards. Yeah. So let's get into the book. So Jay, um, first of all, a little bit of background for people. Um, I'm going to put it like this so people can see it, even though they have it there. This is, I, if this were a TV show, I, I think we would do like that. Um, so, um, for people that, that don't know you, you were born in the Bay Area? Yeah, I, I'm, uh, born and raised uh, in Marin County. Uh, Marin anybody, County. Marin people out here? A couple? Woo! Maz. Maz is, uh, also a fellow yeah. Marinite. I was born in Iran, but I, I grew up in Marin. Now you, now you have your, your father, Iranian, mother, American. Midwestern, Illinois. Mary, Mary Jo. There Mary you jo. go. Yeah. Mary. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Mary Ellen, actually. Mary Ellen. Uh, and my folks met in the Bay Area in the 1960s um, and started a family. And, you know, Iran was uh, sort of a distant part of our lives. My dad had moved uh, to the U.S. in 1959 and over the years started bringing relatives over, which is kind of a common theme, I think, in a lot of immigrant families. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> It's a really good point. Yeah. Shut that door. That, yeah. It's not happening anymore, Jason. <laughs> I got a couple of cousins that I'd be fine sending back, but um, no. I, so you know, we 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 were a, a large family, uh, mostly Iranian. My mom was an only child. Uh, my dad had uh, eight brothers and sisters. Four Holy of moly. them moved to California. So we were kind of split between uh, Marin County and uh, Mashat. Yeah. Uh, and you t now explain because we live in LA now. Um, uh, I mean, I live in LA. You don't live in it. But like when I moved down to LA, I, I had a shock because there was so many Iranians here. Now, t did you run into Iranians in Marin, and what was that like? Well, most of them were my cousins, and uh, and then as time went on, um, you know, into the late '70s and, and early '80s, uh, the community started to grow and grow. Uh, and every once in a while, um, you know, you'd run into to people. I didn't speak. Uh, Farsi growing up at all, but I could understand when somebody was speaking Farsi. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have that kind of, that language radar that yeah. pricks up. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, Marin is now a pretty integrated place and we've got cello kebab and, you know, lots of rug shops. Uh, well, you know, I don't know if you had the same experience. When I would run into Iranians in Marin, it was an occasion. Like, it would be like, uh, are you Iranian? I'm, I'm, are you, oh my God, give me a hug. And it, was a, it became a thing. Who's your dad? Who's oh. your dad? And then it's like, oh, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now you grow up in Marin. You go to uh, Santa Fe High. Is that where you're Marin Academy. Marin Went Academy. To private school all the way through. Yeah. And then coming out, you decide, what, what, did you, what did you want to do and what did your parents want you to do? I wasn't sure until about midway through, uh, through college. But, uh, you know, my dad kind of wanted me to go into business. He thought I had an entrepreneurial streak. My mom um, was, you know, a, kind of a, a recovering hippie mom. You know, do what you want to do. Live your life. 
Uh, she had traveled a lot as a, as a high school and college student. Uh, she had studied archaeology. Um, so I had this adventurous streak, you know, one, one parent who had moved from the other side of the world and one who um, had, you know, gone out and explored the world. Um, and uh, it was when I was about 21 or 22 that I decided that, that I wanted to write for a living. What I didn't know at the time is that you can't really write for a living. You know, you can't really make a <laughs> living doing this. Um, Please buy his book. Buy my book. <laughs> Many copies. I'm trying to make um, a living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know, it, it was uh, it, it it was tough going from the time I was you know uh, graduated from college up until uh, until I moved to Iran in uh, 2009. So okay, so because I know that you and I met somewhere, I think in mid 2000s, you were yeah. writing for the San Francisco Chronicle, weren't you? Yeah, so I was a freelancer, freelance writer, writing for the Chronicle, writing a lot about Iran. I travel there a couple of times a year. Uh, and write little dispatches from there and when I returned. And over time, I'd built up a body of work, uh, mostly focused on, on Iran and Iranian issues. Um, and then in 2009, I joke about the Persian rug business, but I literally had a shop uh, in, uh, in San Francisco, right off of Union Square. What was it called? Rug Jones. Rug Jones? Yeah, yeah Rug Jones. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you got Jones, you need your rugs. Yeah, and, rug Jones, um, all right. Get some drugs, get some get rugs. Get some rugs, yeah. There you go. And um, I opened uh, about three months before the financial crisis in 2008. Good timing, James. Yeah, it was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So um, I didn't do very well. Yeah. And uh, I thought to myself, okay, if I'm ever going to take a crack at, at, at writing um, full time, now's the moment to do it. So I, you know, I packed a... A single suitcase, I uh, sold a couple of rugs for cash, put that cash in my pocket, and, uh, and got on a plane and moved to Tehran. Had which you, sounds crazy, but it seemed like the right thing to do at the moment. Had you been to, how many times have you been back to Iran before that? The first time I went was in 2001, and I'd, I'd been back and forth probably 15 times. So in 2001, when you go, you're what? 25. Uh, 25. Now tell me what your impression is when you go there in 2000, that was your first time ever? Yeah. What was your impression of Iran? Um, and were you in Tehran or what other places did you go? Well, first I went to see my family in Mashhad and I got stuck in that family web, you know. <laughs> For those people that don't know the family web, it's like when you go, then there's all these cousins and parties and things you got to go to, right? Yeah, and I mean, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't thin when I got there, but I think I put about 15, 20 pounds in, in the first couple of weeks because it's just like, eat, eat, eat. Yeah, you, you know? gotta wonder. It's like, are, are, are they all just waiting for you? Like, yeah. Because you do. I swear, you're right. When yeah. when when a guest comes, it's because the, the hospitality is so like it's, that's a big thing in our culture, hospitality. Yeah. So it feels like you know they they I, sometimes you go, don't they work? Like, what, how do they? Yeah. <laughs> so um, you know, I I some of you probably saw uh, when my wife and I were on Anthony Bourdain's show. Yeah. Um, and um, it was a really important show, I think, um, you know, generally, but the Iran episode in particular. And I had an opportunity to talk to him about it afterwards. And I was talking about the hospitality. And he said, yeah, a murderous generosity. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And he mentions it in that show. For anyone who hasn't seen it, you should try and track it down. When Anthony Bourdain goes to Iran, he does say that he didn't expect them to be the most hospitable people he'd ever met. And they really are. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the Iran marketing department isn't doing very well for itself. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it, could be, um, it could be branding uh, a whole lot better than it has been for the yeah. last 40 years or so. Tell me about it. <laughs> so you go the first time, you get caught in that family web in Mashhad, yeah. and then you go to Tehran. What's your impression of Iran the first time you go there then? I mean, you know, if we can, let's put politics aside for just a moment. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating big, frenetic city, Tehran. Uh, and it's that combination of old world and, and modern world that we don't have access to here in the United States. Um, and for me, as somebody who wanted to write and write about the world, um, I was like a kid in a candy store. There's a, there's a story to write around every single corner. Um, so it was, for me, um, just um, very addictive. Right off so the, the bat. seed was planted then, and then did you go, come and go several times? Many or? times, yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I made a documentary film there. 
um, about you know kind of being a, a, an American Iranian and, and returning back to Iran to see what it was like. Um, but I'd always come back to the States. I'd go two, three, six months at a time. Uh, but home was, was Marin. So, because I'm trying to figure out what, when you said, so you, you, you've been coming and going, you've made the film, and at what point, and the rug business doesn't go well, uh, and, uh, and you go, so at what point do you go, eh, I'll go, I'll just go live there? It was, it was I think, October of, of 2008 when um, I hadn't sold a rug in a couple of months, and uh, the rent in this shop was thousands of dollars. And I thought to myself, rather than racking up any more debt, uh, I could probably, you know, make a couple of bucks and, and write some articles over there and then make a go at it. So you thought you'd go there, because, you know, like most people, if they are living in, where were you living at that point? In Marin. So if people are living in Marin, they might go, you know what, I'm going to go try my hand in Los Angeles. I'm going to go to New York, <laughs> give it a shot. You said, I'm going to Tehran. I'm going to Tehran. <laughs> and, and, you know, a lot of people... Uh, and by the way, you don't read and write Farsi at this no, point? No, 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 no. I spoke pretty well. Not as well as I did after I got out of prison. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I would tell people and they were like, whoa, you know, you're going to do what? And, um, and I did it. And you bought a one-way ticket to Tehran. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah. So you go there, because, you know, when I went and visited, I never thought in my mind, because now you were, you were born here and you grew up here. I grew up here. Right. And when I went and visited, as much as I loved Iran and as much as I loved seeing my relatives, I just felt that what I'm used to in my life is just the American way of life. Right. So to get up and move there seems like an extreme move. So were you in like a, in a, uh, in a adventurous place, a desperate place, all of the above? Or what, were you, what were you thinking when you got on that plane going, you're like, were you, were you like, give me one more shot of vodka where I can legally drink it? No, 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 no. Look, I had enough experience in the country up to that point that I, I, I knew how things worked and how they didn't work there. Um, you know, I was a little bit desperate. You know, I was in my mid-30s uh, at that point. And, you know, my resume said, um, you know, a couple of, uh, places that I'd written articles for, and Persian rug salesman, failed Persian rug salesman. Yeah. And, you know, when you put in a job application, I mean, most Iranians are either, you know, in their own business uh, or uh, working for, you know, great big corporations like, you know, Google or Uber or whatever. Um, you know, I didn't have a, a resume that I could send to Uber. <laughs> right. I had a resume that I could send to uh, the Washington Post. Um, and uh, I could complete a sentence and I had a body of work uh, at that point, and, and, and there I went. So you go, you land in Iran, and then you, uh, uh, right away you get the job with Washington, but do you apply no, to no. Washington? No. No, no, I, I freelanced for a while, and that job opened up while I was there. And, um, and they came in and kind of got me. You know, they, Washington Post contacted yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, they said, we heard you're the guy. I said, who told you I was the guy? <laughs> I owe that guy a few bucks, you yeah. know? <laughs> Um, but it turned out that I was the guy. So now here's the next question. So what year is that? 2000 2012. So 2012. I've been there two and a half years. By 2012. Now. You're, you've been, uh, for two and a half years, you've been writing uh, just articles here and there. Uh, full time. But, you know, for, who? for everybody and their mother. I mean, you know, from, from, from American publications like, like the San Francisco Chronicle, Foreign Policy, Slate, um, Time. At any point as you're writing, because we know now, okay, the, the people of Iran are great people, hospitable, the family, right. all that stuff. But we know that the government, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. they can keep an eye on you. So they just show up like at some point. Like as a jerk, like as a comedian, I personally would not go because I feel right. like, you know what I'm saying? They might be like, so, that joke's not very funny. You exactly. Know? <laughs> yeah. Try again. Try again. Yeah. So as a journalist, as you're writing all these articles, was there any time somebody knocked and said, Jason, this article you wrote, you, you made a little comment we don't exactly. like. Exactly. Why, why you, yeah, it, that happened a few times. Um, and, you know, if, if you know about the landscape there for, um, for media, you have to go through uh, a very sinister sounding uh, ministry. The ministry, ministry of, right? the ministry of Islamic culture and guidance. Oh, Jesus. These are the no people. No pun intended. No, exactly. I mean, this is, this is the same uh, organization that signs off on whether or not you can produce a movie, publish a book, 
uh, work in media, um, and this is well known by American and European news organizations, and the decision has always been made that you know we're going to send correspondents to Iran with the understanding that they're not gonna have the same kind of freedom of movement uh, and freedom to do their jobs as they would in most other parts of the world, uh, but it's important to have eyes on the ground in a place as uh, critical strategically and, and geopolitically as Iran. Um, so, you know, I, I had spent years sort of um, learning my ways around how to navigate, how to, how to navigate that landscape. Um, and the, the red lines would change from time to time. Uh, and the, the constant sort of we are watching uh, is always there. And at any point did you think, eh, I should get out of Iran for a minute, you know, let it cool down? Did that ever, like, did Sometimes. you? Sometimes. You know, and in those five years that I lived and worked there, there were a couple of moments where I thought to myself, you know what, it's probably better not to be here right now. And did you leave or you stayed? Yeah, yeah, I left. And in 2014, uh, literally the day that we were arrested, um, we had our press credentials by that ministry extended for a whole year. Same wow. day, same day. So they give you the press credentials and then they threw you in prison. Not the same guys. Right, right, but right? yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's the problem, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of different guys. Um, there's a lot of guys, you're right. Uh, that could have been the name of your book. There's a lot of different guys. Um, yeah. uh, uh, we talk about seven of them in the book. <laughs> seven but, yeah, of them in the book. Yeah. So, and then the other thing is I want to set this up because you also at some point started a, uh, a, a fundraiser. A, a, a Kickstarter, Kickstarter project. For, yeah. avoc for an avocado farm. Yeah. Um, you guys are familiar with Kickstarter, right? How many, how much, how many of us are Iranian? All right. Well, that's good. Um, we like avocados, right? By and large, we like avocados. Do the we hate world, avocados? Avocado toast is the is thing. Is a thing, right? Yeah. In the years that I lived in Iran, you could not find avocado toast. You could not find uh, guacamole. You couldn't find avocado anything. You were without avocados in Iran. Yeah, and I wanted to know why. Um, was it a sanctions thing? Was it a, you know, a, uh, is it haram, you know? Yeah. Are avocados halal? Um, I, you know... I was trying to kind of uh, make a point, which was this country that, that is so uh, big and old, and all of you will agree that, you know, we can grow anything there. We grow the best melons in the world. We're and, very you know, proud you know, people. Proud people, proud of our pistachios and all of this. But you can't grow uh, an avocado there? That's not possible. Um, why is that? It was a very kind of tongue-in-cheek sort of thing. Um, I failed miserably again in, um, in, in raising the funds uh, to do that project. Uh, and it never came up again until the night that we were arrested. And this was... So tell the story. Yeah, so, you know... How did the avocados... The guy wanted avocado toast? No. No. <laughs> no. You know, he, so, you know, in the, literally the first interrogation after we were taken to prison, um, you know, they had me blindfolded. Uh, my wife, Yegone, had been taken away. Uh, she was somewhere else. I didn't know where. And they start bombarding me with all these questions. Uh, and there's lots of people in the room, and, you know, it seems very official. Uh, it smelled official, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, lots of dudes, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. and, uh, and one of the first things he launches into is he starts talking about Kickstarter and avocado. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> I'm sitting there, you know, like this. I'm like, you know. Is he speaking in Farsi in or in Farsi, English? In Farsi. In Farsi. So I'm like kind of trying to peek out like, is this guy serious? Who is this guy? And he's, you know, going on. He's like, look, we don't know what this is code for, but it's code for something. <laughs> so, I mean, Operation this, Avocado. Avocado. Yeah. Yes. So this persisted for six months. And um, they were trying to break you on the avocado, avocado thing. Not only the avocado thing. There was a whole. Because you know they are of shaped it. like hand grenades, so maybe That's you true. were trying to smuggle in. And uh, you know they would, you know, as time went on, and they would, you know, kind of probe me on other subjects. They would keep saying, you know, we gave you a break on that avocado thing. You have to. <laughs> 
finally one day about seven months into to this ordeal, uh, my interrogator and one of the other interrogators show up in my cell and um, the other guy is you know, wearing a surgical mask and sunglasses and a baseball hat you know, to hide his identity and he's holding this paper bag. I'm like, oh my God, what's in the bag? And they pull out an avocado. <laughs> And the guy says, uh, we bought two of them. We tested it. It was disgusting. <laughs> well, there you have so it. So different guys. strokes for different folks. Wow. You know? Wow. So it was all over avocados. Well, That's why. you know, that was, that was one, of, one of many things. I mean, you know, I, I recount this in the book, but like, you know, one day I was... Um, you know, the avocado king. Next day, I was a Mossad agent, and then it was MI Shish, and uh, you know, um, what else? You know, I was fermenting a, a feminist revolution. I was, uh, I was. Uh, are you Jewish? I said, Am I Jewish? What, is, what does that mean? I like coffee. I like a cup of Joe. I said, No, you are a follower of Prophet uh, Moses and Solomon. I said, No. Well, aren't we all? You know. Yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, it was it was complicated. So that's uh, okay. Going back a little bit now, you were saying you met your wife Ye Yegona there, and you talk about that in the story in the yeah. book. She's here tonight as well. There she is. Give it up for Yegona, <laughs> Yegi. I've been lucky to get to know her and see you several times, and you guys are wonderful. And uh, I don't know if there's truth to it or not, but on Terry Gross, you said you're considering kids, maybe. Well, if Terry, you know, Terry knows how to pull it out of you. Okay. But yeah. All right. All yes, right. certainly. All right. Well, we're. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to hear that, Thanks. man. I'm happy to hear that. Um, so, uh, so tell tell the story of meeting Yegana because I also think that that's important to the story because it it makes it so that correct me if I'm wrong. Obviously, is is that is that now there's. There's even more at stake when you're in yeah. Iran, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we um, we met in the summer of 2009. Uh, you'll all remember that in June of 2009, there was, a, you know, a, a election or selection, whatever you want to call it, that's still being contested now 10 years later. Uh, and that was one of those moments where I was working in Iran and I um, realized that it was probably better that I not be in the country. It was a very threatening time, especially for, for journalists and foreign nationals. So I went to Dubai, which is what you do, right? Um, that's the pressure valve. That's the place to go and kind of um, escape from things that are happening in Iran if you need a little bit of a break. So that's what I did. And one night I was interviewing uh, someone who was sort of an uh, Iranian opposition type person. Uh, with a friend of mine who was working for uh, for ABC News at the time, and we were having a conversation with this guy, and he was trying to explain to us what was going on in the protests, but he hadn't been in Iran in like 20 years. You guys know about that. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of that that goes on. Yeah. You know, I see it on TV all the time. I'm like, what is this guy talking about? He's, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, and so I told my friend, I said, you know, I think there's not much going on here. And uh, And the guy said, just wait. Wait a few minutes, my two cousins, they're visiting me from Tehran and they've been in all of these protests uh, and they're here for a few days. And so we waited and, and a few minutes later the door opened and these big, you know, branded bags from the Dubai Mall walk in and behind them is my wife. Wow. And, you know, I was, you know, in love at first sight and it was a really kind of incredible uh, feeling that I never thought would be possible. Um, and she went back to Iran, and it, it was several months before I returned. But during that time, we, um, we would communicate every day, you know, texting, talking on the phone. Was, I think it was about four months before I went back. And, and when I returned, um, I was in the midst of a relationship. And, uh, you know, as most of you know, Iran's not the easiest place to date in, you know. They don't make it that easy. Uh, but but we, uh, we were, figured it out. Um, and, you know, I, I watched this woman who had a master's degree in English translation, who, you know, anywhere else in the world would have incredible opportunities. 
but was stifled by by the um, uh, really patriarchal system that yeah. exists there. So um, one day I said to her, I said, why don't you give journalism a, a try? You know, uh, you speak English, you write English, um, these jobs pay in dollars. You know, you're working in a company where they don't respect you, they don't pay you, they're supposed to pay you, they never do. Uh, there's no future in it. Uh, and, you know, very quickly she went from being, uh, you know, a long-term uh, unpaid uh, office worker to Bloomberg's correspondent in Iran. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, and since coming to the U.S., she continues to write. She writes for the Post, for the Washington Post sometimes. She's done very prestigious um, fellowships at Harvard and George Washington University. She's... Um, on the Press Freedom Committee of the National Press Club. I mean, you know, she's, she's thriving here. So you two, here you are now, you're two journalists. Yeah. In Iran. Yeah, that, that was my bad. Oh, man. <laughs> and an avocado farm. And, and it's really... An it imaginary looks, avocado farm. It really farm. suspicious to me, yeah. Jason. Yeah. Um, so you guys are getting ready to go out on the town one night or go to a another, yeah. another event, and what happens? So, you know, we were... Um, we were actually three days away from coming to the U.S. Um, we'd been married for 15 months. By the way, this like it, you don't have you, all you needed to for the movie is just the. I mean, it hap, I mean, it's great. The, I mean, for the movie, if you were pitching this, you'd be like, and then, and then we're three days away. We just got renewed, and we go for, and then the thing and then happens. It happens you know, right. Yeah, it's great. If there's a screenwriter, he's ready. <laughs> And if I have any meetings, will you come with me? What's that? If I have any meetings, will you come with I'll me? I'll come to the meetings. Well, you were talking about side story. You were talking about that 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 the movie you you and the interrogator, right? Yeah. Yeah. You started talking about the movie. Well, he 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 started talking about the movie. He said, "When you make the movie, yeah, one day you will be free and famous. I will still be policeman." And you know, the poor guy <laughs> wanted to be invited to the premiere. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a cry for help, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> And then he said he wants he who does he want to play him who do you want Well he asked me who I wanted and I tried to explain it to him and I said uh, you know I'm thinking to myself I want Denzel Washington <laughs> And he said which one There's so many black people in Iran, in Iran Yeah he said which one's he and yeah. um, I said well um, training day and and he said uh, no that man is very thin he was talking about Ethan Hawke. <laughs> oh, he thought you were Ethan Hawke. Yeah. Oh, okay, Ethan yeah. Hawke. And then All said, right. No, no, no. Um, uh, glory. And, you know, they don't show glory in Iran. Yeah. Um, and then finally, uh, he figured it out. He said, oh, Malcolm X. There you, you go. Know? Um, and I said, well, who do you want? And uh, he says, uh, well, I, you know, if you can be black, I can be black. Um, I want the bad boy. I said, the bad boy? Uh, he said, uh, the bad boy. You know the bad boy. I said, Martin Lawrence? He said, no, 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 Independence Day. Will Smith. There yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah so that was, that was sort of um, one of the very many bizarre moments during our presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to play Barack Obama. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> and it's going to be a colorblind casting left and right. We're going to have to set it in Nigeria rather than Nigeria. Iran. Nigeria. <laughs> um, yeah, so we so were getting three ready. Days, three yeah, days we're, away we're, from going to America. Going, going to America. And not only was it three days of going to America, it was three days to go into America to get Yegane's green card. Wow. You know, I mean, I don't know if any of you guys have ever done that, uh, you know, spouse immigration process or done it from abroad. Uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world. I mean, there's a lot of paperwork. You've got to go to an embassy. You know, you have to prove that you're really married. Um, and um, and so we were kind of, it was the last hurrah hanging out with family and friends that we were going to go to. And as we were leaving our apartment um, to go down to the garage where a taxi would pick us up, um, the, do the garage door opened. We came down to the elevator. And there was a guy standing there with a gun. Holy and, moly. And, you know, it was just like that moment that you just freeze. 
Did you think right away that it was uh, government, or do you think you're getting robbed? Like, did you have? Well, you don't have those kinds of robbers in Iran, right? right? You just you got a lot of things in Iran. Yeah, you're right, 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 right. That doesn't really yeah, like yeah, guys yeah. in suits don't so show you up knew. with guns. Gun, government. Yes, exactly. Oh man. Um, and they pried their way into the elevator and came up to our apartment. Uh, we went back in. They ransacked the place completely. Separated my wife and I. Um, and uh, it, was, it was an incredible scene. I mean, very suddenly there was a couple of dozen of these plainclothes security officers, again, most of them with surgical masks on to hide their identities. And they either had a gun or they had a video camera. One and or the they other. cuffed you at this point? No. Okay. Um, and they, they, you know, made us open our safe. They took our passports, our IDs, our money, our computers, made us relinquish our passwords uh, to all our devices. And then, you know, they took us down in the elevator. And uh, this is a really typical thing in Iran, uh, and probably in most authoritarian states, they kind of paraded us in mm. front of neighbors, you know, uh, that walk of shame. Um, but it's also a deterrent factor, right? It's like, you know, be afraid. So um, they, they put us in the back of a, a van with tinted windows. Uh, blindfolded us. That was the first blindfolding of many. Um, and handcuffed us and took us to Evin. And Evin, for those of you who don't know, it's the, I mean, a lot of Iranians know, but the, for those who don't, that's the, the main political prison, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, the, it's a big, massive prison that's been around for a very long time. And uh, the vast majority of, of political prisoners are kept there, yeah. And what do they tell you when you get there? What do they say the charges? Well, you know, initially in our house, they don't, don't really talk about charges. They just said, you're coming with us. Uh, and then I'm in this room where the guy launches into avocado equals espionage. Wow. Yeah. And then, and then so from there it begins. Yeah. And they keep you for how long? 544 days. 544 days. And uh, now Yegi, they let go. How, they, how, how long do they keep her? They kept her 72 nights, all of them solitary confinement. Jesus Christ. And if, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I use the opportunity to talk about solitary confinement because it's a horrid practice that should be outlawed everywhere in the world, including in this country. Um, it's designed to make people go insane, um, and it works. So, and you had to do, did you, you had to do solitary confinement as well? 49 days. 49 days. Now, you tell the story here again because, you know, obviously there's a lot of dark moments, but there's also getting through those dark moments. And you talk about some of your, here, I'll open that for you, some of your, uh, your cellmates. Yeah. And you had a couple of really colorful, interesting cellmates that helped you get through this. Do a little bit, oh, sorry, here. <laughs> there you go. This is full service, we said uh, hospitality. <laughs> Hospitality. All right. Um, so tell us about a couple of these cellmates. Actually, there was only two of them. I right. Mean, I, I write about both of them. I never see anybody else. Right. Um, and uh, I never interacted with any other prisoners besides these two guys. Uh, one was uh, an Iranian, uh, Kurdish Iranian businessman who owned. Uh, um, one of these non-alcoholic beer companies. Um, and uh, he's still in prison. Um, what was he in for? For being Kurdish and for Sunni. being Kurdish. And rich. And rich. Okay. Yeah. Um, a financial crime. You know, you're oh, too successful. Boy. Yeah. Um, and the other was a guy from Azerbaijan, from the Republic of Azerbaijan. And um, he was... Um, like me, being accused of being a spy. He's just a businessman yeah. who lived across the border. There's a river called the Jolfa River up in Iranian, Iranian Azerbaijan on the border of Azerbaijan. On both sides of the river, there's a town called Jolfa. He lived on the other side of the border. And since the end of Soviet times, he'd been going back and forth, um, importing and exporting various things. Um, and this one time, after hundreds of times back and forth, he got picked up and thrown into Evin. He was picked up uh, 10 days before I was. And uh, I remember the first time that I saw him, 
uh, when we kind of were both brought out of solitary. Uh, and I thought to myself, wow, that guy looks terrible. Uh, do I look that bad? And I saw, I could see in his eyes, he was like, wow, that guy looks like crap. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, I'd lost 40 pounds um, in a very fast period of time. Uh, and, you know, we were all of a sudden in a situation that was immeasurably better than solitary confinement. I can't express enough how terrible it is to be in solitary. And, you know, really quickly, though, you start to realize, oh, my God, I'm living with a person who doesn't speak a single word of a language that I speak. He spoke no Farsi, no English, and I don't have any Azeri Turk or Russian, which were the two languages he spoke. So our, our, biggest, um, our biggest challenge was to figure out ways to communicate with each other. And we had plenty of time <laughs> to figure that out. Um, so we, we lived together for 13 months. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and he was released uh, two months after I was. And so we talk, right? One of the things that, um, that happened over uh, the period of time that we were together was that we had access to... Um, an Iranian state television, right? Seda Sima, you know, the IRIB, and its whole, you know, family of channels. Is that kind of like a, is it state? So is it like Fox, basically, kind of? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's exactly like that. Um, and... Uh, you, know, you know what I'm saying. So, I mean, there's yeah. like the news channel, and then there's... But the, the, the interesting thing to me, because when we, when we were free in Iran, like every other Iranian, I just watched satellite TV. I never watched the local stuff, because why would you watch it? It's garbage. Um, uh, but they play a lot of Hollywood movies. They played Hollywood movies? Yeah, but like censored versions of them, right? Hilarious. And so, you know, I'm sitting there watching. Um, you guys seen uh, Philadelphia? Yeah. yeah With it, Denzel. Uh, yeah, with Denzel and, and Tom Hanks yeah. and Antonio Banderas, right? Yeah. So Tom Hanks and Antonio Banderas are brothers in that movie. Oh. Right? As opposed to lovers. As opposed to lovers. Okay. Right? It changes, like, so the storylines change. Holy moly. So, so one day we're sitting there <laughs> and I'm, I'm watching TV and the, the Big Lebowski comes on, right? <laughs> And I'm, I'm watching this movie. Yegona came, uh, she was allowed to visit me every once in a while. And she came the next day and asked me, you know, what's going on? I said, well, last night I watched The Big Lebowski. And we had watched it recently at home before we were arrested. And she's thinking to herself, that's not a movie that they can show on TV here. How long was it? Well, it was about 35 minutes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was no... Uh, urinating, there was no uh, hostage girl who was in the porn business or anything like yeah. that. It was just a rug and, and some bowling, and that was that. Hilarious. Go on your way. The big bowling Lebowski. Yeah. But my favorite was um, that, that uh, documentary about the, the, the Japanese guy that has the, the um, sushi restaurant in the subway station. Right. Um, so we're watching this thing, and my, my cellmate, you know how... The, Azeris are, you know, they're a little kind of gruff sometimes. Yeah. And he's like, in chie. You know, the guy's eating say, what is this? What's he eating? What's he eating? I said, well, it's fish. He said, that's not fish. I said, yeah, it's fish, and it's fish and rice. And it's really good. <laughs> he says, is it raw? I said, yeah, it's raw, and it's delicious. And, he, I mean, he just could not get over this. <laughs> uh, and then... Six months later, after I was released, I get a message on Facebook from him one day. And uh, he's got a niece back in Azerbaijan who speaks English. And so she's our translator. So she's written this whole thing about how happy he is and how, you know, I'm a nationally known person in, in Azerbaijan and everybody knows my face. And by the way, I tried sushi ah. and it was really good. And he's, he, he sent a picture of it. It was, it was awesome. fantastic, yeah. We talk all the time. We, we, we joke about how both of us have put all our prison weight back on. That's tough with sushi, but you did it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Lots of rolls, man. <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, you know what's crazy is because it's, what, 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 what pisses me off is that you're just living your life. 
right. and I know you and you're a good guy and that this could happen to somebody. And then you hear that it's happening to this other guy and then the other guy. Right. And uh, I mean, that's why I think, I mean, it's an amazing story for people to read because there's so much that goes on. Um, and and my, one other question I have for you is, you know, I took a class in college. It was called the Sociology of Brainwashing. Mm. It was all about how they would get these prisoners of war in Korea. Right. And they would brainwash them. And after a while, after, you know, whatever it was, years being in these prisons and then putting them, to, uh, letting them talk to other American prisoners, they would start to turn them and they would start to say, you really are, look, you're working for this, for this country that does, you know, whatever, dropped a bomb in Japan and does this, this, and this. Was there any point where you either thought, you know, maybe these guys, not that you're a spy, but maybe like, maybe, you know, the, the way these guys are seeing the world, like, maybe there's something to, were you ever at that breaking point? No. I mean, look, I spent a lot of time in that country, so I understood how these guys see the world. Right. And um, I, I tried to reason with them. And uh, oftentimes I try and tell them, uh, how wrong they were, right? And I right. would tell them, you guys, you guys, you can't win. You can't win because you can't put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And you're never going to be able to bring me on your side. And not only are you not going to bring me on your side, you're losing your own people every single day. Um, so I think that it's, um, it's a losing battle that those guys are fighting. Although um, there's a lot of people that are suffering in that country in prison and out on the streets. Yeah. Um, but no, for me, look, while I was in solitary, they were saying, all you got to do is, you know, go to court and plead guilty and we'll give you a death sentence and then the next day we're going to send you home, <laughs> right? And, you know, I mean, it sounds kind of crazy, but at the same time, if you go back and look at history of authoritarian states, they do that sometimes. Right. But that's a crazy gamble, yeah. right? And not one that, uh, I, I did think about it, but Yegi was very adamant about the fact. Yeah, I was going to say, Yegi in the book, you talk about, she said, uh-uh, don't, no don't way. play that game. No way, Hossein. Yeah, yeah. You know, she was like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that. No way, Hossein. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, she, she uh, yeah, she said, look, you know, it, you might be in here a little bit longer or a lot longer. But the last thing I want is a husband who, uh, you know, went went and admitted to things that he didn't do, pled guilty in yeah. a situation like that. Yeah. So, you know, the court process in the revolutionary court. By the way, if you ever find yourself on trial in a revolutionary court, it's got revolutionary in the name. You know the ending. You know. So, um, just. Do your best to, to fight through that situation because it's really like um, it's so ridiculous and farcical what's going on. But you have to be able to keep separate sets of mental books and tell yourself, okay, what they're saying is ridiculous. I need to respond with the truth. I didn't do anything wrong. And at the end, I also know that I'm going to be guilty no matter what. Right. And it wasn't a matter of winning that case in an Iranian court. It was more about winning the, the, the battle of international public opinion, right? Didn't you have moments, like you said, I think you, in the book you mentioned, you either had moments in court or with your interrogator where you were like, you are ridiculous, or you were like making fun of them and they didn't even ca you know, get it. Yeah, and you know they would say things to me like you know, and I w you have to play along. When my my the decision that I made was that when I was in Evin prison, I would do exactly what they told me. Any time I came out of prison, and that usually meant to court, I was going to be defiant and say I didn't do anything and demand my rights, which were going to be denied to me. But I would kind of keep up that front, and then they take me back to prison. I said. Jason, what happened? You were supposed to plead guilty today, but I, you know, used their own psychology on them. You told me to tell the truth. You know, you told me God would strike me down if, if I didn't tell the truth. So, you know, what's more important, the judge in the revolutionary court or God? You decide. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, I think I was just um, feeling tricky and uh, and using that strength that that my wife 
was able to instill in me. And also, when she and my mom could visit me, they would tell me about the things that were going on outside. Um, and I mean, you know, when, when you hear that Muhammad Ali issues a statement for you to be released, that's crazy. Yeah. You know? So you kind of pump up your chest a little. Well, you think that's crazy. How about when you find out you're being negotiated, like there's a negotiation going on with John Kerry. And I mean, I know it was Yegane and it was your mom and your brother were really, Ali, were really working hard. Big time. Right? And I know that, you know, I, I, I got asked, I don't know, by your brother or Yegane, I don't know who, who reached out, but they were putting videos together with people to tweet you know, free Jason, and I was like, okay, I'll do it, of course, and so the, the community's coming behind you, you got Muhammad Ali, and then all of a sudden, who tells you they're negotiating this, the nuclear deal, and you somehow are a part of it? Yeah, I mean, you know, they, at some point, they, they start, I mean, that's a big, you know, I mean, like, <laughs> you're like, wait, Muhammad Ali is negotiating the nuclear deal? I'm confused. <laughs> I mean, at a certain point, I assumed that I wouldn't get out until that deal was completed. Yeah. But I didn't think that we'd get thrust into the whole process. And part of that process, just to clarify, was there was, I think, four uh, Americans? Or how many Americans were in? So there were, there, there were several Americans in, in prison there, and there are several that are still there. Uh, one in particular who was there, two actually, who were there and didn't get released with us. And um, in exchange for seven Iranians who were in prison in America, there was many more Iranians in prison in America, some of them on terrorism charges. The ones that were released were for, you know, uh, they were in prison for sanctions violations. And didn't you say the ones, the Iranians that got released from the American prisons were like, uh, we don't want to go back to Iran. 100%. Not a single one of them went back. So basically... You know, they talk about a prisoner swap. What actually happened was, you know, uh, 11 Iranian Americans got free and settled back in America. <laughs> that's that like should a, have been the headline. But that's, you know, a, that's, that's a good math problem for kids. Right, exactly. If four Iranians are released in yeah. Iran, <laughs> Americans, and seven in America, <laughs> but they all decide to stay. Yeah, yeah. no, it was, it, it, it was, and I think the, the Iranians still have some egg on their face about that. In a big way. Well, I mean, it's unfortunate, but yeah, I mean, obviously the the government there is uh, very unstable, and 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 as you as you said, and as you've experienced, there are innocent people being thrown in, and and you know, I almost I, I say it feels like they say you're a spy until you prove you're not a spy. That's that's exactly it, and you can't prove that you're not. Right. Right. I mean, and it's funny because I don't know if you run through this. I tell a lot of my American friends, I go, "You can go to Iran. It's a beautiful place. You should go." Like as a, as a. I never tell anybody. You don't that tell either. them that. No. I used to tell them that, but yeah. now I can't be the guy that's like, "No, no, no. It's beautiful. Go." You should go. <laughs> I get emails all the time, like starting the week after I was released. Yeah. You know, my Washington Post email is at the bottom of every one of my stories. And people will be like, you know, I'm so happy. I followed your story. I've never been to Iran. I saw you, Anthony Bourdain. I was so worried about you. I'm going to Iran next week. And I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, definitely don't ask me if you should. Yeah. You know? So, uh, you know, we got to wrap it up. Anyway. I just want to get up to a part of the story. Now, again, you guys, this book is amazing. I honestly, I couldn't put it down, and you won't be able to. And, and, and don't wait till the movie comes out because. <laughs> We're all going to know. We're going to be like, oh, we knew Denzel and Will Smith. And, um, but, but no, it's, it, 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 gets, it gets even crazier when the release is happening and you tell the story of how the, your interrogators are still kind of playing a game with you yeah. where they have you, they basically tell you that, why don't you tell the whole story where, where there's money here and you're there and Yegi and your mom are there. Tell that well, story. Well, it's crazy. So uh, January 16th of 2016, is the day that we were supposed to be released and that the whole nuclear deal was to be implemented. Iran was going to pour concrete into uh, you know, its nuclear enrichment sites. The U.S. is going to lift sanctions. Uh, the U.S. is also going to return some money to Iran. Uh, and that money, by the way, because a lot of people criticize that money going back, but, but, the, but the truth of that money is it was a deal that was made before under the Shah, right? Yeah, and look, I mean, it wasn't like America was returning that money out of, you know, goodwill, right? I mean, this is money that for 40 years had been tied up in America uh, and that Iran had taken the U.S. to um, 
to the International Court in The Hague. There's a channel set up for these disputes. Um, and they were about to, 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 fa to reach a judgment in favor of Iran for over $4 billion. Mm. Uh, so we got a good you know, little break on that for $1.7 billion. Uh, and, and by the way, I should mention that the same court um, has um, issued verdicts against Iran in favor of the U.S., and Iran's paid over $2 billion to the U.S. in, in the same court over the years. Um, and then the other piece of the puzzle was, was the prisoners. Um, and and the, the, the deal that had been negotiated was to include uh, myself, Amir Hekmati, the Marine, Saeed Abedini, uh, the pastor, and any spouses. And, and Yegi was the only spouse uh, in that situation. Um, but the IRGC, who had the Revolutionary Guard, who had possession of me, uh, didn't want to uh, accept that part of the deal. You know, my wife is so lovely that she should stay in Iran. You know, um, and I didn't know that. I mean, I wasn't like you know given a copy of this contract that says you know Mrs. Resign gets to go home. Um, she was brought to the airport to, to kind of say goodbye to me. Uh, With I mean, the idea that then they're going to let her go later. Someday. Right. right. But, you know, first it's, oh, a couple of days. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah, it's yeah. a couple of weeks. And then it's like, who knows when. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was the most, you know, surreal scene because you had all of these uh, television cameras from state TV, you know, kind of documenting the whole thing. Finally, she was taken away, and then the Swiss ambassador, you know, Iran and the U.S. don't have diplomatic relations, so the Swiss embassies are protecting power, the U.S. protecting power in Iran, shows up in the room, and he says, where are the others? And I said, you know, you mean Hekmati and Abedini? He said, no, 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 your, your mother and your wife, they're going with you. And that's the first that I'd heard of that, um, you know, for... They, you know, they had always said that that Yegi would be, you know, allowed to leave at a at a, at a later date. She wouldn't be able to go with me, um, and that it was just one more manipulation that they were trying to pull right at the end. Uh, and I didn't find out until many hours later that my mom and my wife were in the same building, locked in a room, with their cell phones taken away from them. Um, and so, you know, it was, uh, it was about eight hours later when I was finally moved to the tarmac um, to get on the plane. And um, they were released from that, that room that they were being held in. They were given their cell phones back. They'd jump in a taxi cab to go home. They're excited because Jason's free. Uh, and, you know, they want to go celebrate uh, and figure out what they're going to do next. They turn on the cell phones and there's like hundreds of missed calls from my brother, from the State Department, from all of these places. And finally, my brother calls up and says, where the hell are you? I said, well, we're here. Jason left. Everything's fine. He said, no, no, no. You're supposed to leave too. The plane is not leaving without you. And it was just this, you know, hair-raising 18 hours that, you know, blow, by blow. Uh, you know, if you get to page 260 of this thing, the last 40 pages or so is... Um, Take your blood pressure medicine before you read it. And it's what's the what's the line that you said Kerry told you or somebody who said it at some yeah, point? Yeah, so you know, I was I interviewed John Kerry after the fact and we were talking about all of this and he said, you know, uh, what did he say exactly? Sorry if there's any kids here, he said, That was some crazy shit. Uh, you know, Bridge of Spies got nothing on this, you know. <laughs> Uh, but you know, all of the people that we've met in government after uh, after this ha happened were really invested in in bringing us home, and also, you know, when they see us, you can tell that um, it almost didn't work out. And there's that line, "No Yegi," what is it? No Yegi, no money. Yeah, yeah because I mean, the 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 that 1.7 billion dollars, uh, which was being returned to Iran, Kerry made it very clear: we're not we're not lifting the sanctions, we're not giving you this money until all of these people get on a plane and leave Iran in No Yegi, no money. I love that. I mean, that's a romantic, that's a yeah. romantic film. It's a romance more than anything else. A prison romance.
Well, I will say this. I could talk to you for hours, and we have, and we continue to, and I just, I, I encourage all of you to read the book and tell your friends to read the book and, and spread, spread the word about this book, because it really is, I, I, like I said, I think it's, it's, it's uh, poignant, and it's uh, funny, and it's, and it's sincere, and, it's, and it, it sheds a light on a lot of stuff that's going on that's not good over there. Uh, and and uh, and a lot of good stuff that comes from there. I mean, it's got a lot. This is a very very deep book, and I would love to keep talking to you for hours, but our time is limited. So if you're okay, we're going to go to some some questions yeah, from sure. the audience. That sounds great. great. So I will bring the microphone to anyone who might have a question. Just a quick reminder: around here, questions typically start with a W or an H. Sometimes a D. They are generally short. There is no such thing as a two-part question. And only Maz gets to ask follow-up questions. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Ted. Hi, Maz. Hi, Jason. Uh, thank you guys just first off for your contribution to the Iranian community. So I just wanted to start off with that. Um, and thank you for moderating this, uh, Maz. Uh, Jason, what kind of mental affirmations were you feeding yourself when you were in prison to keep yourself sane, um, positive throughout the whole situation with what you were dealing with? I think over the first couple of weeks, you're so confused by what's going on um, that hope and fear and um, desperation haven't really set in. All of these things are sort of really abstract. Right? But as the days start to stack uh, and you worry about when you'll ever get out, um, the thing that was helpful for me was making plans in my mind. That, you know, I just assumed, I had to assume that at some point I was gonna be reunited with my wife, that we would go home, and that we would have a, a long future in front of us. Um, and I never, never fully lost that hope. But when you're in solitary confinement, it's a different thing entirely. I mean, I'm looking at this rug right now, and I know my, my, my rug metrics, this is about seven by 10 which makes it about 40% uh, larger than the cell that I was in. Jesus. Um, and so, you know, I spent a lot of time pacing back and forth uh, in that cell. And you, and you just try and stay kind of mentally engaged. So I would, I'd count, I'd make lists, I'd list all the places I'd ever been to, list the places I wanted to go to. Um, and, you know, generally just try and keep my mind occupied with things that would not lead me to thinking about what they might be doing to my wife. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering whether the people who interviewed you in the prison, were they at one point realized that you are really innocent? Or were they told, you know, and then they realize, no, that you are innocent, and will you be able to touch their soul and realizing that, you know, they got the really wrong guy? I think that they realized that I was innocent. The ones who didn't understand that realized it pretty quickly. Um, but they have to keep going, you know, with this uh, job of theirs. I mean, you know, the the Revolutionary Guard's main purpose is to ensure that the Islamic Republic continues to exist, right? Um, so, you know, if they're told that I'm a big threat to the, their country, I'm a big threat to their country in, in their eyes. Uh, but I remember the, the, the last meeting that we had a few days before I was released and my mom and my wife were able to come and visit uh, and they had told us that I was gonna leave in a few days the interrogator, my main interrogator and his boss came to this meeting and basically they were trying to get us, they were doing damage control. They knew that I was about to get out and they wanted to make sure that I wouldn't say certain things when I left and they were trying to get me to sign a contract that I wouldn't sue Iran in international court, which I did very recently. Um, and uh, they said to me, just think of it as if you were doing your, you know, it's 18 months. Just think of it, you were doing your military service, you know? I mean, that, that was the attitude that they had, you know? Um, and I said, look, I paid for 
the right to not do my military service. At least give me my money back, yeah. you know? But yes, I mean, I, they knew I didn't do anything. Um, hi, Jason. Um, first of all, my friends from uh, this campaign on Twitter called at Undo Family Band wanted me to thank both of you for speaking out against this cruel tragedy, tragedy that's you know, it being imposed upon us in the Iranian uh, American community, the travel ban. And uh, as someone who's overcome and dealt with a really difficult situation, what is your suggestion to all of us sitting here who want to fight and overcome this, this cruel travel ban? Thank you. Well, look, I mean, I think first and foremost, uh, the big difference between the fight that I had and the one that people in the community and, and immigrants and, and their families who are trying to uh, get back together here in the United States was that we have channels in this country uh, to, uh, to fight those fights. Uh, the media is a good one. You know, and I was talking with my wife before we came over here, and I'm glad that um, you mentioned the travel ban. I just put out this short film and, and piece about American couples that are being separated by the ban, one Iranian spouse, one U.S. spouse, they can't be together because the Iranian one is not able to enter the U.S. Um, we tell these stories in, in, in newspapers on, and on television, but also, I mean, you have to hold the local, um, you know, your local representatives, senators to account. And I've been really pleased to see that, that there's been a lot of motion over the past couple weeks against this travel ban. And I, I for one, hope that it doesn't last any, much, any longer than it already has. We have time for two more questions. Um, hi, first of all, thank you for doing this. It's been a great experience. Um, I'm sure in Iran there's not really due process rights as there are here in the no. United States. No. And um, when you were going from your prison cell to court every time, did you have an attorney? And if so, were they actually trying to defend you? Did they believe you? Or, or was it court appointed? Or how did that work exactly? So we had an attorney that, um, that Yegi was able to hire. Um, and I think, like I said before, I mean, we understood that I wasn't going to win that case in court. Um, she wasn't allowed to advise me. She was never allowed to visit me in the prison. Um, we uh, never had a one-on-one -on -one conversation to, to build a defense because she wasn't allowed to. Every, every meeting I had with her uh, was with the judge, president, and also the prosecutor. Um, so that, that was the sort of situation I was up against. But where she came in handy was, you know, every time uh, we'd have a court appearance, she could come out afterwards and talk about all the ways that my rights were being trampled on. And, um, you know, for that, I give her a lot of credit because that's not an environment where uh, most people are willing to do that. And our final question for the evening. What do you think put you on the Iranian government's radar? Was it the Anthony Bourdain interview? Was it your job? Was it Project Avocado? Mm -hmm. I want to say first that it had nothing to do with us going on the Bourdain show. I mean, he became such a huge advocate for us while we were uh, in trouble. And uh, I know that, you know, he was asked that question so many times and felt some guilt about it. But it, that was the furthest thing from the truth. And if anything, the fact that we appeared on his show and that episode was played over and over again, I think uh, it did more to raise the awareness about us than almost anything else. Um, I think ultimately it was that I was an American citizen working for a big American uh, news organization at a time when, you know, domestically within Iran, there was a lot of contention over whether or not they wanted to do this nuclear deal, and forces that didn't want to do the deal we're looking for ways to make it harder for the two sides, for the US and world powers to come to an agreement with Iran. And my arrest was one of many things that, that they did. I don't think they had a real plan uh, when they took me about how they wanted this to end. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Wonderful evening.